Hi everyone. Um, Welcome to the first of our series of sessions we're going to be running. Um, this one's all about open high street, uh, new use of historic buildings. Hope you're in the right place. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, my name is Mick McGrath. I work for Locality. Uh, we are one of the partners uh, to this um, initiative, which is uh, being led by um, the Architectural Heritage Fund who are providing the resources for it and you'll, you'll hear some of their staff in a few moments. So uh, that's who I am and you will have a series of other speakers who will be introduced in a short while. Next slide please. Rose. So just a little bit of um, housekeeping. First of all welcome to this webinar. Um, all the attendees are muted uh, and we're expecting well over a hundred um, and the numbers are going up at the, at the moment, so um, welcome and hello. We'll try and keep this manageable by, by keeping this um, as simple as we possibly can. One thing we'd like you to do, and some of you already done that, is to submit your questions via the question box uh, or on the event padlet. Um, there will be question and answer session at the end, so you do get your questions in there and we'll seek to answer certainly some of those, uh, depending on time, but we'll make sure we answer all the questions after the event if we don't have time. So the webinar is being recorded and will be available to view on the Heritage Trust Network website next week. Um, and there, there is an attendance certificate and link to a feedback form which will be emailed to you this afternoon. So hopefully you've all got access to the Padlet. If you haven't, hopefully you can see the chat box. Um, and if you just want to type in there, then uh, one of our colleagues will pick that up and that will be added to at the end. So, OK, next slide, please. Okay, so I'd like to introduce you to uh, Matthew and Kelsey, first of all. Uh, this is the bit that often people always like to hear about, the money part. So um, over to them, they're gonna give you an overview of the Transforming Places Through Heritage, uh, and then you'll hear a bit more from me and then the rest of the speakers. Thanks, Mick. Uh, hello, everybody, uh, and, and welcome to, 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 to the first event in, in this series. I'm, I'm just gonna give you a couple of brief headlines about kind of transforming places through, through heritage, um, the program uh, itself, and Kelsey's gonna talk a bit about the, the kind of um, uh, the funding awards that we've made um, to date. Um, the, the, the sort of origins of the program, um, which has been running for, for nearly a, a year uh, uh, now, uh, we, we got slightly interrupted with, with launching um, this particular program because of a, a virus that you might have, have heard about. Um, but its um, its origins really um, are in um, uh, the fact that AHF has, has, has long invested in, in, in high street and town centre uh, uh, projects, um, and this is um, Curzon Lodge uh, in uh, in Ipswich, um, and this is a Grade Two star uh, uh, building um, in in kind of one of the uh, uh, main streets of uh, Ipswich, kind of links the town centre um, to the quayside uh, area. Um, next slide, Bev, please. Um, and um, this was it in, in about 2007 before um, Ipswich Building Preservation Trust um, invested uh, uh, in it. Um, so they borrowed about 350,000 from uh, uh, AHF. Um, and then it was made up with uh, uh, other uh, grant funds um, in, in delivering the project. So they brought back into use the, uh, uh, the lower floor uh, as retail, um, and then they uh, put a, uh, an Airbnb into the uh, uh, upper levels. And um, really diversifying uh, uh, the uses of the building, bringing people back into the, um, into the town centre as well um, through, through accommodation use. It's a very, very nice Airbnb if you're ever staying in, 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 in Ipswich, uh, do look it up. Um, but really this kind of use um, is, is one that we see uh, uh, as really important um, to, to, to kind of the regeneration um, of uh, uh, town centres. Um, that regeneration has just become more and more important. Um, uh, it, 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 was a, it was an issue before COVID and COVID has really um, exacerbated uh, the problems um, facing uh, uh, the high street. Um, our, uh, program is, is really focused on uh, uh, charities and social enterprises uh, and the role that they can play uh, in the regeneration of, uh, of town centres um, and, and high streets. Um, uh, charities and social enterprises um, are playing a vital role um, alongside uh, uh, public and private uh, organisations um, and that is something that, that our program uh, specifically focuses on. Um, it's part of a, a number of uh, uh, programmes investing in town centres and high streets. Um, so there's a future high street programme uh, that's being run by MHCLG 
um, which is awarding uh, funding to, to local authorities. And then there's Historic England's um, uh, High Street Heritage Action Zone programme. So our programme sits within uh, that wider uh, uh, programme um, of initiatives. Uh, next slide, please, Bev. Um, so as I said, we launched in 2019. Um, and our specific focus is on supporting charities and community uh, enterprises and social enterprises to regenerate um, historic buildings. Uh, what we see uh, uh, becoming more and more important is that we, we move past the idea of town centres as just being kind of uh, uh, retail uh, uh, spaces um, and, and, and trying to reimagine repurpose town centres and, and high streets with different types of uses, whether that's art spaces or workspaces or, or culture. Uh, 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 uses community-led housing is something else that we we also want to invest in. You'll hear a little bit about that from from Stephen and his project uh, 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 later. We've got an expert team of advisors um, uh, 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 working on the program as well and assisting um, projects with the development um, of their ideas. Um, and um, this capacity building program is one part of the uh, uh, sort of advice and guidance uh, service that we're. Um, providing lots of new organisations coming forward with projects so we think it's really important to be investing in the capacity of those organisations to deliver uh, projects and that's why we're working with HTN and Locality uh, both of which have significant expertise uh, in, in this uh, uh, area and um, so really really good um, that this programme of events is now launched and up and running and providing that kind of advice and guidance to, 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 to organisations. Uh, we hope you get a lot out of uh, today in the series um, of events um, and you know do provide us with, with feedback and, and, and ideas on, on, on what you would like to see uh, uh, come out of this. I'll just hand over to Kelsey who's going to give you a, a bit of a flavour of, of kind of the grants that we've awarded uh, uh, so far. Kelsey. Thank you Matthew. Um, I, I just wanted to talk through a little bit about what we've done thus far in the in the programme as Matthew's mentioned we have been going ju just under a year. It'll be a year in September since the first Transforming Places grants were awarded. And as you can see, we've given out a, a number of grants. And we are, as, a, as an organization, we traditionally specialize in those early stage grants, the very earliest stage of, of kind of project development, when just when you're on the cusp of taking something from an idea into, into something that you can actually have a, a fully fledged project. But one of the, so we have a, a lot of those grants, as you can see here, we call them project viability grants. That's where you're testing, you know, the end, what is the proposed end use that you have in mind? Is it actually viable? Is there really a market demand for it? Will the building be appropriate for, for that end use? All of those questions really can be addressed in a, that the kind of viability stage, which is where we see as the kind of beginning of, of, of a, the project kind of as properly conceived as a project. So we, we've done quite a lot of work there um, and we, we will continue to do so going forward. Certainly if you have ideas, you want to kind of bring forward and test some potential proposed end uses, that would be where, where you'd want to look uh, to, to get some support initially. Following on from that, um, so just briefly, some of the kind of, I, some of the kind of project development grants, project viability grants we've funded so far have been things like there's a, a beautiful former fire station in Ramsgate, where it's a, an extraordinary building and you know not quite clear exactly what you're going to do with it, want to do something, want it to be relevant to our post-COVID world. That's obviously a, a new angle here, but it's something we're trying to kind of be, be sympathetic to. I think a lot of these, a lot of the, 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 the model we had five years ago for what you do with your heritage you know, development project sometimes it's not necessarily gonna um, gonna still be viable going forward you know at least not in the medium term you know so some of those ideas are coming forward in ramsgate we've got projects in, in colville in in dudley really diverse um type of buildings of, of of all kinds of different ages and 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 geographically kind of spread across across the country the, the next stage really for us we consider the kind of project development stage and that's where you, you've got you feel you, your project is viable, your idea will work, the building will work and support that. And there's market demand. Now you need to get your architect's drawings, your, your costings all sorted out, you need your legals, et cetera. Maybe you need to constitute as an organization. And that's really that, that project development stage. And some recent projects we've done there have been things like the, the generator in Loughborough, anyone who knows it, they're, they're looking at kind of developing some uh, innovative workspaces, you know, where 
promoting the kind of entrepreneurialism and things like that. So that those kind of products are, are really great. We we those are a larger early a larger potential fund uh, for for larger amounts of um, funding available for, for those projects. And then what's really exciting for us about transforming places through heritage, which we don't normally get to do, but we are doing here, is having the opportunity to actually fund a couple of new types of grants. One are crowdfunding challenge grants, where you're really capitalizing on your local group, your local community, and, and gaining interest and buy-in and, and, and support from them. We think crowdfunding grants are, are excellent ways, not only of bringing in additional funding, but also of really engaging your community. So, so these grants are really one-to-one -one matches. You can hopefully, we, we encourage people to, to come to us, apply before you start your crowdfunder, we can help you publicize it. So we, we've been doing some of that. There's a wonderful project in Wooler that's looking at some social housing, some community-led housing um, that's just completing there that, that we, we've given some support to there. Um, the, additionally, we've got these transformational capital grants about which you're gonna hear um, from Stephen and his, his wonderful group in, in Bake Up. Uh, you can hear a bit more about that. Um, so I will leave those aside, but those are essentially capital grants. They, they, are, um, at a, they allow us to go up to a higher level. Um, and, and the final real, set, real kind of exciting, two exciting areas are the Community Shares Boosters. And again, we're all after innovative funding models. Everyone knows that you, know, you can't just rely on traditional grants forever. Community shares, we believe, are a great way, again, like crowdfunding, but in a longer term model or for in getting your kind of real investment from your, your community. And we can help support you to set those up as well as making equity investments. So please do look into look into that or be in touch if you're interested. That's in partnership with Co-op CK. And uh, last but not least, also relevant to, to Stephen, um, we have a, a model called the Heritage Development Trust, which we've been very excited to help take a small number of organizations and it's a model we're doing a pilot we'd love to should we be able to be prove the success to be able to put more money into this in the future but we are looking at trying to prove the the model by which a, a specialist organization in a locality can really push the the heritage led regeneration within that area to really help restore when you've got specialists like Stephen available you can really make a difference for these these complex projects so that's some of the kind of stuff that we've been doing. And uh, I, I, I will look forward to hearing, speaking more about it later on. Okay, Mick, I think we're uh, over to you. Great, thank you very much. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, so yes, just just before we move on, um, it's it's really really good architecture. Heritage Fund have got grants open. You'll probably be aware if you've been looking around funding that virtually all of it is on emergency COVID uh, support grants at the moment, which makes it really, really difficult for groups to be able to plan and sort of uh, start thinking about the stages of, of their project. So, you know, I'd strongly urge you to to use that in, in a lot of ways. You're lucky that it's there because um, I'm certainly aware of other, other projects and groups who are struggling because they're not getting access to that sort of support at the moment. So, um, anyhow, um, so just in terms of giving you a little bit of, of sort of scene setting from a locality perspective, locality our membership organization we're very much about helping uh, organizations in their areas um, to develop up community hubs and you know make make their areas much more sustainable and viable and provide the kind of services they need but um, so in terms of transforming spaces through heritage um, within the locality membership you know these are just just some of the examples we've got so community libraries vacant shop spaces theaters cinemas community centers village halls playing fields woodland parks pavilions commercial spaces housing factories schools public toilets uh, train stations and I'm sure you've got examples of others so you know the reality is there are lots of people out there like you with lots and lots of enthusiasm lots of great examples and one of the things we really hope from this program is that you'll be able to sort of find out from others how they've done things share collaborate and learn from each other next slide please so I'll just run through some examples. Um, this example is the Guildhall in Newcastle under Lyme. Uh, there's a friends of a group there who are trying to bring this back into long-term community use. Private sectors failed, uh, the public sectors failed in, in finding proper uses for this as a building and it's right at the heart of, of the town. So you know it's something which is uh, 
really, really important to the community and something they want to protect and have for the community use. Um, next slide, please. If you're able to do next slide. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Um, and th through through this program, you know, it isn't just um, urban cities and areas. Oh, there we go. Um, it isn't urban urban areas, just urban areas. It can be um, rural communities as well. So, for example, this this is one from Caister in Lincolnshire, which is Art and Heritage Centre. Again, this was a facility which was previously owned by the local authority as a sort of youth facility, but it just didn't wasn't able to have the resource or support needed so the community decided it was something they wanted to take over and it's brought a heritage building back and in fact in this instance they've got um, a range of heritage facilities there as well uh, but also things such as community cafe and so forth as a way of bringing the income in. Next slide please. Um, Queen's Mill, this is in Castleford, uh, it's, it's, it's run by Castleford Heritage Trust, you know, they, they've taken over a big uh, facility which was um, falling into disrepair, wasn't being used um, and it's provided a really important uh, location and venue as part of their sort of town centre regeneration and, you know, this is largely run by a community who saw saw a facility which they had really good ideas for and which they then brought back into use. Um, it's, it's a great, great facility. Next example, please. Um, Mosley School of Art, this is in uh, Birmingham. It's, it's a really interesting one. It's led by the uh, Mosley Muslim uh, Community Trust who decided they want to take over an old school uh, facility which was on the at-risk register and they've basically through blood sweat and tears managed to uh, get 2.6 million pounds worth of uh, grants and so forth together and now they're very much bringing this back into community use um, but they're also being very very canny about it it's all very great having a newly refurbished building but you need to have the clear ideas as to what you're going to do with it and what's going to provide the income so you know there there are examples such as Michael talk about later on in terms of um, community space for um, co-workers and so forth and you know in this instance they're, they're looking at the arts arts and cultural side as well to to bring the community together but more importantly to get lots and lots of users for that facility next slide please um, of course uh, there are lots and lots of examples such as the Casbah conservation area in Grimsby which is on the at-risk register um, there are lots and lots of places and I'm sure this is where you'll come in um, and buildings and facilities which need a kind of vision which need tender loving care which need people coming together um, to make make things happen and change things um, this is one which has recently been funded by the Architecture Heritage Fund as well so it's kind of quite a nice example of the before and hopefully uh, we very much get to the after part. Certainly I know in this instance the local authority are very keen um, to do asset transfers and aspects like that to really kind of get uh, community groups uh, really really engaged and sort of to to develop enterprises in there and to make it a lively hub as opposed to a ramshackle place which is just falling down. Next slide please. Um, I'm based in Nottingham and Nottingham's a really interesting example of uh, they had a multi-million pound um, retail development of, of the town centre where they were knocking down a 1970s uh, facility which had just become very tired. Part of the way through that uh, Covid hit but before that I think they were starting to have wobbles in terms of the private sector thinking hang on a minute doing, doing the usual things in town centres, city centres isn't going to work anymore. So uh, what's happened is Into which is uh, one of the largest um, retail uh, developers have basically paused it and said sorry we're not doing anything more at this stage. Um, that's left the city council with a big problem and one of the interesting things is that um, the city council have now said okay we need some short to medium term 
new new uses for this facility and it's great a lot of the community are coming together in terms of saying well actually what we want is a green park in that area to cover some of those spaces certainly in the short to medium term whilst alternative uses can be found and this is something the city council are looking at really really seriously so you know it's really really important to think in in this climate uh, more of the same is unlikely to work to be perfectly frank um, so you know the idea of just building more shops more cinemas and so forth isn't isn't going to sort of do it so you know I think increasingly uh, local authorities and others are looking at ways in which they can be smarter and have to be smarter in terms of uses um, and you know it's all about all of us now thinking about what might uh, opportunities be and sort of how to develop them so with that uh, next slide please I'll move you on to Stephen, who's going to tell you about his community story and what they did and how they did it. Over to you, Stephen. Thanks, Mick. Um, so I'm Steve Anderson. I chair uh, an organisation called Valley Heritage. Um, uh, I'm a volunteer in that role, um, and for my day job, I work for Buttress Architects. Um, so I've got hopefully about 10 minutes to talk you through the Lancashire New Yorkshire Bank um, project we've been working on for about 18 months now. Um, just to introduce Valley Heritage, we're, we're a small building preservation trust. Uh, we have four trustees, um, a number of brilliant volunteers um, set up about five years ago um, as a CIO. Um, and um, we've also recently taken on our first member of staff, thanks to becoming one of AHF's uh, Heritage Development Trust pilot organisations. And we're perhaps a little bit unusual as a BPT in that we set up, um, rather than for a single project, um, we, we set up with an aspiration to find new uses for redundant heritage assets across our area, uh, which is Rosendale in Pennine, Lancashire. So the building is located in Bakeup, uh, a mill town which grew through the Industrial Revolution um, and has been, I guess, in decline ever since, really. Um, so the building was constructed in the 1870s. Um, it was um, uh, done in this kind of very distinctive Scottish baronial style. I think you're going slightly too fast for me, Bev. Thank you. Um, it's um, uh, quite unique in, in the town. Uh, it's the only building in this style and um, it, uh, it creates a, a real high street landmark um, in its corner location. Um, the town centre is a conservation area at risk um, and it's been described as the best preserved mill town. Um, I think this is because it really escaped any major redevelopment during the 50s, 60s and 70s, which actually was because it was economically not in a great place through that period. Um, it had a number of programmes thrown at it, all the acronyms, SRB, CAPS, uh, Housing Market Renewal, which many of you will know as Pathfinder, none of which really stuck. Um, but most recently, it's had a Townscape Heritage Initiative, uh, which concluded about a year ago. Um, and this one seems to be sticking. It seems to be having a real impact. Uh, with, with footfall, um, with um, improvements to vacancy rates and with a growing confidence in the town. Um, and following on from, from that programme, uh, the local authority have applied successfully for High Street Heritage Action Zone funding um, and are in the process of applying for future High Streets funding with, with the aim that through the, this kind of critical mass of investment, um, real change will be affected and um, hopefully it will be lasting change this time round. Um, so the building itself has got quite a checkered history. Um, after closing as a bank in the 1970s, it had a variety of uses, uh, everything from an Indian restaurant to a funeral parlour. Um, most recently, the upper floors were converted to a number of um, pretty dingy, horrible bedsits. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that um, shortly. Um, the ground floor, um, I think you would describe it as somewhere between um, a, a letting agency and a second hand shop. Um, we weren't quite clear which one they were going for. They seemed to be hedging the bets. Um, the bedsits themselves have been let on an unmanaged basis. And um, there were a number of individuals living in there with real challenging social needs. Um, and it became um, a kind of hub of antisocial behaviour within the town centre. Um, and it spilled out, um, you know, it didn't help that it was um, adjacent to a pub. Um, um, it, it basically became um, a real problem in the town. Um, and it got to the point where the local authority felt they had to serve a prohibition notice. And basically they closed the building, shut it down. Um, so the council then worked quite proactively with the owner, um, attempted to um, engage with him and uh, get some positive action to bring the building back into use. But the owner felt that this was beyond him um, and the property was put up for sale by auction. 
Um, the photo here was taken um, shortly after we took ownership. And by this point, we pretty much filled the first skip. So you can imagine what we were faced with um, in the first instance. So next slide, please, Bev. So this is a photo from one of the bed sits upstairs. Um, might give an indication of, of some of the antisocial behavior issues that the building was faced with. Um, we, we found out that the property was going to auction about two weeks ahead of time, um, which um, wasn't enough time to raise the 185,000 that was the guide price for the property. Um, we did talk to the owner. Um, we were working with the council's empty properties officer at the time and, um, and she made an introduction. Um, we explained our situation and, um, and described the process that we would need to go to uh, and, and the time that might be taken. Um, and the owner decided, um, perhaps quite logically, um, that they would see what happened at auction and take it from there. Um, the auction took place. Um, it didn't sell. Uh, the offer, um, the highest offer that was made was 188,000, uh, but the owner had set a reserve on the building of 215,000, quite ambitious, um, uh, and, um, and didn't go through. So we contacted the owner again, um, had a good chat, and with a little bit of encouragement from the council, um, the owner decided to give us the time that we needed to raise the funds uh, and work through the process that we knew we were going to need. So the, the time that we agreed was three months. Um, we knew that that was probably a bit ridiculous, um, but we'd have a go at it. Um, but we also knew at that point that going through any grant funded process for the early stages work that we were gonna have to do was, was likely impossible. Um, but I think at Valley Heritage, we're quite lucky in that we've got a range of skills. Um, and we were able to produce um, and develop those kind of initial concepts and the initial documentation um, to work through the funding process in-house um, through lots and lots of hard volunteer graft. Um, we, we spoke to HF, began discussions about loans um, and um, also looking at other funding options to deal with uh, the refurbishment stage of the project. Um, alongside all of that, context within Baycut was starting to move um, and um, the High Street Heritage Action Zone and the Future High Streets Fund applications were all starting to coalesce so we knew that that context was, was kind of playing into our hands a little bit. Um, we had also at that time had the experience of applying for an AHF loan on another property and, and it was an invaluable experience and that particular project was at a stage where it was it was kind of not going to go ahead um, but it gave us lots of kind of valuable insights into um, you know how you go through the process possible uses that might work um, it had also given us an introduction to IndieCube um, and Michael talk a lot more about them in a little while um, but their approach to co-working felt like a natural fit for a town like Baycup um, and it, it kind of gave us um, a really strong use option for the ground floor of the building um, straight away um, so we, we used that advice uh, that we got from IndieCube and uh, found that that side of things was likely to be viable um, and we went forward on that basis. Um, I think we also knew very early on that a return to the bed sits and all the problems that they had given um, would just be wrong. Um, you know, we wanted this project to be socially beneficial for the town, not to create new social problems. Um, so we um, we thought, you know, residential use was probably right, but not the same kind of residential use. Um, at that time, we'd also been developing a partnership with uh, an organisation called M3 Project, who are a charity that support young people at risk of homelessness. Um, they um, had been in discussions with us about trialing a model where Valley Heritage provide um, residential accommodation for M3 Project's use. Um, I think we're working in a context where um, registered providers have their own pr uh, pressures um, and organisations like M3 Project would normally rely on registered providers to give them accommodation, um, but there just isn't really enough to go around. Um, so another outlet through Valley Heritage seemed like a really natural fit. So the discussions with M3 Project bore fruit. Um, they agreed to take two of the apartments um, that we were going to develop as part of the, the four apartments that we were converting um, from those seven bed sits that were in the property. Um, the, the residential stock in Baycup is primarily targeted uh, at uh, people who are on housing benefits um, and it creates a very narrow mix of occupancy and, and residential use. 
So we felt that targeting the other two properties that we'd, we'd designed into the project in a way that sought to diversify that residential mix would be um, a, an important step. Um, and that was the, the route we decided to take. Um, we needed to then market test our ideas at a point where we had no funding in place. Um, the, the relationship with the, the property owner was a little bit fragile. Um, and we were really con kind of concerned that if we went very public with the project, um, that we would kind of scare the horses and we would lose the deal that we were developing at that time. Um, the, the loan um, was, was kind of in train with AHF at that point and, and we were getting kind of positive indications that that would work through the process. Um, but it did mean it was a kind of difficult stage to, to be really open. So we just had to do kind of what we felt we could. Um, so we, we obviously did lots of research. We looked at the residential market. We spoke to property agents um, on an informal basis. Um, we attended some community meetings and, and talked about our ideas. Um, and um, uh, one of those was uh, Bakers Business Association, which proved to be quite an important um, uh, kind of feedback loop for us. Um, we also held a, a number of pop-up co-working events, which were really helpful just to, to test the concept, see what appetite there was for it in the town uh, and get some really kind of positive reactions, which reassured us that we were heading in the right direction. Um, the work that we'd done at that stage was, was really important, I think, in, in persuading AHF that this was a, a risk worth taking. Um, and, um, and ultimately, um, the, the loan agreement progressed um, with AHF working very much in partnership with us throughout the process. Um, the loan provided us with funds for acquisition um, and some working capital to deal with um, some issues around urgent works that were needed to the property and um, and kind of you know other acquisition costs that we knew we were going to have to bear. Um, we were able to leverage some gift in kind contributions um, and um, and Rosendale Borough Council gave us a grant of a thousand pounds and and it's difficult to overstate how important that thousand pounds was. You know, we, we had a kind of stage in, in the acquisition process where if that thousand pounds hadn't have been granted, um, the deal probably would have fallen through. Uh, those, those kind of small pots of early stages money are just fundamentally important to these kind of processes. Um, as you'd imagine, uh, the process took a little bit longer than three months. Um, and, and at times it was a bit of a roller coaster. Um, the owner lost patience several times, um, but I think again, working in partnership with AHF, um, their officers um, were able to kind of provide us with reassuring information that we could pass on to the owner um, and show that progress was being made and, um, and kind of calm the owner's nerves a little bit. And so the purchase completed in, in November 2019, which is uh, nine months after our first interest in the building was, was expressed. Um, so as, um, as proud owners of the building, um, we set about, I guess, two main things. Uh, one of them was clearing it out. And, and you've seen some photos of the mess um, and the full skip, um, which had maybe given indication of just how much uh, we, we've had to do. Uh, we've still got a long way to go with that side of things. Um, and, and then the funding side of things, um, we um, approached AHF under, under the Transformational Project Grant part of Transforming Places programme, um, and our first application was unsuccessful. Um, but, you know, fortunately, and, um, and, and with thanks to AHF, we've made it through second time round, um, which was just announced a, a little while ago. Um, Part of the, the learning process of that first failure um, was that our other fundraising efforts to find the match had probably not been quite good enough. So we really stepped that up early on this year. Um, clearly, uh, COVID-19 has, has had an impact on that. Um, and the, the way that we've sought to address that is basically to work harder. Um, it's kind of been the only way to, to tackle it. Um, we, we've just kind of approached every trust and fund we possibly can. And whereas normally we might have confidence that if we um, applied for, you know, somewhere between uh, around double what we needed, um, so about £55,000 in cash is what we need as match, um, that we'd we'd raise that money. Um, we've basically applied for more than triple uh, what we need. And um, because of a couple of funding successes, um, notably um, the Duchy of Lancaster Benevolent Fund came on board just before AHF's decision, which which no doubt was, was helpful and supportive to AHF's decision-making process. 
Um, now that AHF are on board, um, we've had another couple of, of grant offers and uh, we're about £15,000 away from our fundraising target now of, uh, of 390000 uh, for the whole of the project. So clearing the building um, and um, a donation of, of furniture from Butchers Architects has meant that we can start using the space and, and get a better feel for how it will work in future. So I think um, if you skip back a couple of slides, Bev. That's the one. Um, you know that that starts to give a sense of um, of what the space might be like, and um, and we're starting to have regular meetings in there and and use it a little bit, which has been it's been fantastic to kind of experience the building in that way. Uh, we're in the process of appointing consultants now to help with finalising the design, um, and our plans for engagement with the community uh, are moving into action. Um, we're, we're, we're planning to co-design the space um, with potential users, which is a really kind of important piece of advice that we received from Indicube that, you know, it's, it's incredibly important that the users have ownership of the space. Um, so we're trying to embed that from the outset and, um, and that's going to be a really exciting part of uh, the engagement process going forward. So with the following wind, um, the next the, the, the refurbishment will start around late October um, and hopefully complete in the spring of 2021. Um, we can't um, leave this without addressing COVID-19. Clearly, um, you know, this has happened while we've been developing the project. Um, and it has, of course, given us pause for thought. Um, you know, are our ideas for this building actually still relevant? Um, we, we've come to the view after a little bit of soul searching that um, it, the, the more relevant than ever, actually, um, homelessness isn't going away um, and perhaps uh, life is even more precarious for young people. Um, so that side of the project is incredibly important and people will always need places to live. Um, and I think in terms of the co-working space, so many of us have now experienced um, working from home for an extended period. Um, we found that less commuting and a better life work balance uh, are perhaps the main advantages of, of home working. Um, but losing the social benefits of working uh, with other people um, in, in the same space and being perhaps unable to readily escape our homes are maybe the main disadvantages. And we feel that co-working, particularly in local centres, occupies this amazing middle ground um, between those advantages and disadvantages. And actually, um, you know, has has all the advantages of home working with none of the disadvantages. It's, it's um, I think, a great opportunity. I think it's also the case that lockdown has, has brought us closer to the places that we live. We've been able to explore and appreciate them in a different way. Um, so it hopefully stands to reason that being able to work in our local centres, on our high streets and in our towns um, through these kind of spaces um, will kind of maintain our connections that we've, we've developed with our homes, um, with our, our, you know, the places where we live um, and, um, and hopefully help us to make um, the venture that we're proceeding on a success. Uh, we, we personally believe that the changes in working patterns are going to be long lasting, not just because the, this crisis is, is going to be here for a while, um, but because of the advantages that we've actually discovered. Um, and, and all of that has added to our confidence in the project, actually, rather than knocking it. Um, we, we also hope that the projects will complete when social distancing maybe is a little bit relaxed um, because the business plan actually depends on it. So um, it kind of better had. Um, Many of you will also be wondering what the little logo in the bottom left of the slides is. Um, we, we decided to name the project Alliance and the logo is derived from the recognisable shape of the turret um, and the letter A, um, obviously the initial to Alliance. Um, Alliance is um, an echo of the past. Uh, the forerunner of the Lancashire and Yorkshire Bank was called Alliance. Um, we hope it also hints at the future for this particular property, um, a community of people living and working within the building. Um, if you skip on to the last of my slides, Bev, that's the one. Um, I thought I'd leave you with the broody nighttime shot um, and um, can now hand you over to Mike. So thank you very much for listening. Hi, how are you all doing? Um, I'm just just getting used to the tech again, um, as we have to. Um, 
Yeah, thanks, Steve. That was brilliant. And thanks for giving us a mention there about um, how co-working can fit in with some of these projects. Um, I've been kind of making notes as things go along. I, I'm, I'm a bit more of a free wheeler and a, and a winger, if that's one way of putting it. So I've been making my notes as we've been going along. And what, um, you know, one of the things I've, uh, I, I've thought really is that um, rather than introduce myself, I'll start with a story because everyone else has done the introductions first. So, um, and this is kind of relevant, if not a little bit um, off the wall. So when I was around eight years old, um, it was the start of term. I was in primary school in my local primary school and we had a new teacher who we um, comically named Mrs. Brillo Pad a few years later because um, she was pretty tough. And um, she came in and she gave her introduction and she said to us all, the, the thing that I hate most and absolutely will not tolerate is people not putting their hand up before they ask a question. So she finished her introduction and, uh, and uh, within seconds of that introduction ending, um, the headmaster walked in and began immediately talking to um, to this new teacher. Um, but I'd had loads of burning questions which were sort of just buzzing around my head um, from the things that she'd said to us and immediately run over and sort of tugged on her arm and, you know, asked something like, so, you know, did dinosaurs really exist, miss? And um, this was immediately followed with a clip around a year and I was sent to the back of the class to look at the wall for sort of 10 minutes. Um, so at a really early age, I was introduced to the idea that, um, you know, if you want something, if you if you if you want to do something for yourself, if you want to take on board, um, you know, an initiative, um, then you need to put your hand up and ask first. And that really is something that travels with us right from an early time in school into adulthood um, and becomes something that's really difficult to unhinge from. You know, it's really taught into our systems to say, please, can I do something? Um, rather than just going and doing it. Um, and um, that's, that really reflects very much on what we've done with IndyQ, because we've seen through and through in the different places that we've gone to, that it's really hard to get people to just go and do stuff. Um, they're waiting all the time to be given the agency to, um, to, to find you know, a route to, to, to what they're looking for. Um, and the idea that they can just go and do it is really quite alien to a lot of people. Even today, you know, I, I'm, I'm meeting and talk with people who are from really good professional backgrounds who still find the idea of just going and doing it, you know, quite, quite hard. Because it's, yeah, but, but what about the system and what about how do we approach that? And it's like, well, you know, if as long as you're breaking any law or hurting anyone, you know, when you find out through mistakes and maybe just trying and, you know, just go and do things. Um, so it, it kind of brings me on to to really one of the spaces that we opened, which was a great example of two people that really just went and did it. Um, and one of the reasons why um, we like um, we liked the way that we did things with IndyQ, which was really to generate spaces that were um, open to um, open to redevelopment. Um, a lot of people asked us about our policy of not really spending money on fit out. Um, a lot of the co-working spaces that were growing up over the last decade have really gone to town on, you know, on, on building desks out of, out of reconditioned railway sleepers and, you know, uh, copper lighting and all kinds of, you know, fantastic kind of setups um, in, in it, within the space. Um, and we really stepped completely away from that, you know, apart from maybe giving it a lick of paint and buying some desks, we kind of left the space as open as possible so that our users could come in and, and as Stephen pointed to earlier, um, try and find some ownership of the space themselves. You know, because the idea that we would open something that was there, that was there for them on our terms, um, you know, that felt really strange actually when we were going into, um, we were going into new areas and new locations that we weren't necessarily from in the first place. Um, so we, we built, we, we created space that was open to interpretation. Um, and the slide underneath in the top corner was our interpretation of a place that we opened in Ho Street in Walthamstow um, a few years back, which was a um, which was a unused um, bank that was on the high street there and had been um, been left to sort of, um, you know, go to go to seed for quite some some time. Um, so we were offered the space on a short term meanwhile use, which is something we've done quite often. And um, we were able to go in and develop it in a very short space of time. We went out, we went into the community, we found a local paint recycling company where we could get paint at a really good 
really good price um, and we weren't wasting we weren't use, using new paint so we were quite happy with that there's plenty of paint you know out there that's already um it's already in the system so we we bought that in um a couple of days we went in ourselves on a very small budget and redecorated the site um you know it was just elbow grease really and a, and a lot of sweat equity to bring it up to speed um we then opened the doors and invited the community in you know there was pretty much about as much as we wanted to do um we really got in touch with anyone and everyone from the locale in in, in Walthamstow Waltham Forest and said come in see the space see what you think see where where you might be able to take this um through a number of those open days um we were um invited to speak to a couple called Dan and Hillary who were really interested in the building because they were about to develop a project called Bank Job Pictures and um clearly you know running that for me from a disused bank seemed like a good idea to them um, so they were prepared to come in and take on the space as a, as a, as a co-working option for them um, so within a few weeks what Dan and Hillary did is really just do what we did and that was to award themselves the agency to go in and just change it you know they redecorated they put up the floor they turned it back into a, an old-fashioned bank um, and set it up as this um, really cool workspace for themselves um, that was not only a backdrop to the film and the project um, but a practical space for them to start the project off i'm not going to go into too much detail about the actual bank job pictures project i'd really encourage people to go and look at look it up online it isn't the jason stratham film that was made a few years back if you come across that it's um it's bank job pictures and um there's plenty of info about it but in a sense dan and hillary were interested in printing um, printing banknotes, which they were then selling back to the community in order to buy back debt locally. It's quite a quite a complex problem uh, project, but um, the actual production line was was housed at the bank um, and was an exceptionally just really heartwarming, interesting, visually powerful um, sort of project that we had really no idea was going to end up happening. You know, at Walthamstow bank um, in terms of us taking it on as a co-working space i think that was just a, a really good example of of people breaking that mold of putting their hand up and asking um, you know they used the space they saw the opportunity and i think they understood well enough from us that it was just okay to go and do that um, and i think if we're developing spaces longer term we have to create some kind of um, sense that this is okay and that actually thinking that into the space before we start to develop it could be a key to its longer term use you know if you develop a space for a project then it's cut to fit you know when that project finishes or moves on you know a few years later then where does that building or where does that where does that space then where is that space then left in terms of its future you know if we're build, if we're developing spaces that are in a sense, modular and are designed to, to be over uh, developed over and over again in a way that just suits the environment that they're in. Then we can really start to maximise the use of the space properly within the environment it's in. Um, and also, I think um, you know more often than not, we create space that's used for maybe nine till five or you know for a few hours in the evening. But there's a lot of dead time to space that we really don't take advantage of. Because again, we've sort of built in kind of barriers to how it's going to be used in, in its design from the offset. So kind of um, so when you're looking at projects and you're looking at taking on space and you know in terms of redeveloping buildings, especially historic buildings where you've got that um, you know you've got that legacy within the community, trying to create it in a way that builds ownership and agency into the wider environment, um, I think is something that we really tried and worked hard to do. Um, I think one of the other things that we found that's really key to this and is, and is a real uh, um, response to um, the COVID issue is that, you know, it's no longer adults that are being forced to work from home, but children are too. Um, you know, they, you know I'm, I'm, I'm single parent, my children have been, have been off school for nearly five months now. Um, they're having to work from home the same as, the same as I am. It's not just a case of I've got some important things to do, but the kids, you know, we're all working from home and we're all in an environment now that's really difficult for all sorts of reasons. And I think whereas for a long time we've tried to advocate the idea that the workspace should be family space as well or, or have those options, I think that's got to become more and more relevant um, in, in terms of what we do with space in the future. 
in that it, it's still really difficult to find even community space that allows for children and families to be able to work alongside each other to do things other than you know other than childcare, but actually create space that that is a, a, enabling both parties to to do things that are constructive at the same time. Um, and uh, you know, from from our point of view, rolling that on into the future, how we go in and what what we look to do within spaces, I think that's got to be something that we really um, that we really take on board and think in more detail about. Mike, we've um, got about one more minute, if that's okay. Yeah. If we wanted to just go on to the next slide, Bev, that would be great. Or the final slide, Beverly. Yeah. So this is um, this is my final slide. Indicate community. It's all about us. And when I say us, it's about all of us. I think the the, the point that we also felt was really important. This is a this is three ladies in a chip shop outside um, uh, one of our co-working spaces in Wrexham. Um, you know, when we create space, we're also in that place and in the wider environment, and everything that goes on um, within within that environment is affected by and and uh, um, and is um, you know and is uh, pushed by what happens in the spaces that we are, we are in. So how we then roll that out into the wider community and the effect that has on things that are local, um, I think, is really important. Not only are we using spaces and developing them in a new way. But we're also going out and buying, you know, our fish and chips from down the road from from um, the Cafe de Gaulle, I think it was called. Um, you know, meeting new people and introducing them to something new that's happening. I think that's a that was one of the keys to the to the kind of um, way in which we look to develop co-working within new buildings. So, okay, thanks. Great, thanks a lot, Mike. I guess uh, Mike's just reflecting there. Um, an experience we have in locality quite a lot, I'm sure you do too, where rather than seek permission, seek forgiveness, I just go ahead and do it anyway. Uh, what's the worst that can happen um, is, is an approach that some take and you know that that's an interesting one. So okay we've got about 10 more minutes or so, uh, we may sort of possibly extend, we'll see how we go with these questions but ideally we'd like to get through these fairly quickly. Um, thanks for a lot of the questions which have come in. Um, just for sort of a speed of clarity really, maybe um, I'll sort of ask people if they could maybe think about a response to um, a large vacant retail unit. Who wants to have a go at answering that one? Yeah, Matthew. Um, so yeah, I, I think big department stores are, 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 are a, a type of building um, where we, we've got a, a, a big issue uh, in the in the country with you know I can't see anywhere now building uh, something uh, like this it's a real kind of uh, shift could you see anywhere building like a, um, a, a meadow hall or a Westfield and we may not regret that but uh, these big department stores some of which are really uh, uh, important buildings um, what do we do uh, with these huge floor plates um, so we funded a, a few things um, uh, recently uh, an old co-op building in Bradford um, so that was a viability study which ultimately found uh, it was too challenging um, and um, uh, so the idea there was around an art hotel and, and, and cultural space um, and um, the viability of that was 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 difficult to to, to, uh, to see um, but that idea of kind of multi-purpose kind of uses, so it was an exhibition space, it was it was accommodation, it was workspaces, was was one idea that I think um, potentially could work in, in in other places. The ownership of that building and the price that was put on it for for, for, for purchasing was one of the issues, and again, uh, that's something that runs through uh, a lot of uh, a lot of projects. In South End, we funded um, a, 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 a uh, age concern south end um to develop the the, the, the havens project which is a, um, a space um for over 50s um uh, i think that, that, that over 50s now uh, uh, where where you qualify for, for for age concerns kind of support uh, so um uh, that is a kind of multi-purpose space for, for for older people the community hub in one of the most iconic buildings in in that part of uh, south end age concern work across the country um, this idea could be scalable to, to other uh, uh, sorts of large uh, uh, places, and that's something that we're trying to look at as well. How do some of these ideas not just work in, in South End or in Bradford? How do you develop something um, that has applicability to, to a range of building types? And that's that's something in terms of the evaluation we want to uh, we want to pick up on. And so so gathering those lessons and trying to uh, 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 piece them together will be something that we're trying to do through the program. 
that's great. Thank you, Matthew. Um, there's another question here about um, many local community groups often have a clear vision for a building, but often struggle to translate that into reality. Um, what toolkits, toolkits, or guidance is there for groups? I mean, I'll just kick off quickly with that one. Uh, locality and, and our partners um, set up a website called My Community, and that's got literally hundreds and hundreds of really useful research documents as a way of uh, being able to help groups with specific things. So I'm sure they'll find examples on there. But quickly, any of the other panelists got got ideas around that? Yeah, Mike. Um, yeah, again, I think it's been able to maybe with forethought create spaces that allow for change, so that um, so that when a community is going into a building, you haven't pre-described what it's going to do for them. Um, how, how do we create modular spaces that can adapt and be agile to um, to the community's needs, um, rather rather than to a specific type of project? I think that's maybe it's in it's in the actual build itself, um, rather than rather than technically how you go about creating uh, creating a space that suits. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, another one here: What are the values you, you consider when regenerating a heritage property? How do you define the values in terms of architectural elements and characteristics maybe one for you Stephen um yeah I'll have a go um <laughs> it, it's um it, it's not not a not a straightforward question to answer because every heritage asset is is unique um so it, it's about trying to understand that particular heritage asset in in some detail um and and to research it and to make sure that you've got a sense of what's important about it um, and then with that understanding, it's possible to, um, I guess, define um, the changes that you might be able to make and, and um, get a sense of how that building might be repurposed um, as a result of that kind of analysis. OK, anyone else want to chip in with that one? Yep, Kelsey. Nine. Yeah, um, I just say that we we are looking as well for what is the value of the building not just in and of itself, not just listings and local listings and things like that, but what is the value that the community sees uh, in the building? If it has a particular history, you know, role in local history, that, that that is relevant. Also, obviously, the the role of the, the building and the streetscape in something like a conservation area is is relevant as well. Um, and I think that, I mean, the challenge that, that we have, and I, I know you all have in trying to bring projects forward, is this need to balance a, a building that, that is um, contributing to the, the broader broader surroundings in this, you know, by, by being architecturally important, sure, but also with, you know, areas that I see another question on here about asking about do we, do we prioritize social need, deprivation, inequality? We certainly do prioritize social impact. Now, obviously, that to a certain extent, that's about the local area that it, it's in, and, and we do gather information on on where projects are based, you know, the, the, the area, we are particularly interested in projects that are based in areas of, of income deprivation, but we are also really looking at what is, what are you trying to do with the project? You know, that is it, that is a key, a key area that we do prioritize. That's great, thanks, Kelsey. Um, just, just, was... Sorry, Mick, just on, oh. um, on toolkits, which kind of links that as well, the HTN toolkit um, is is one that people should 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 use. There's also the um, the Brick program uh, that was uh, uh, previously run by Princess Regeneration Trust. The, the web resources um, are still available. We can uh, send those uh, links round, and some of those will help with kind of you know significance and and, and, and understanding uh, that in, in in the context of the building. Historic England have you know resources on 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 that uh, too. So. Um, those are two other kind of toolkits I, I just mentioned and, and, and are relevant to that uh, question of significance. Okay, brilliant, thanks. Uh, there was a question earlier on as well. Um, how do you get hold of a building? Um, and again, Stephen and Mike, I know you sort of touched on some of this, but um, is, is there a simple way of doing this? I mean, perhaps I'll kick off with with a way communities can can start start the process is by registering it as an asset of community value with the local authority it's a relatively straightforward process um, some local authorities like it as a process other local authorities hate it but um, you know you need to find your way but that's certainly a starting point but yeah in, in terms of finding that building um, I'll actually get in hold of that building any sort of pearls there I think for for Valley Heritage the engagement with the local authorities empty property property officer has been really key 
um, they're, they're working really hard to kind of understand um, what property is out there that is in need of a new use. Um, so we, we've kind of maintained a dialogue and, and eventually over the period of time we've been operating, um, we've kind of become a part of that team. Um, so that, that gives us an insight into the properties that might be available um, and gives us a kind of springboard to start discussions with, with owners. Um, so that's been pretty key for us. Okay, Mike, do anything? Yeah, um, I think it's it's been slightly different for us because we've usually taken on space that we've been approached by the building owner um, to, to help develop um, rather than going out and actively looking for buildings to go into. Um, but I, you know, I think a lot of the time, again, it's, it's first of all, it's just, it's asking the question, you know, if, if you're interested, who is the person and finding out up front, you know, if, if there is a, a real chance of you developing it, um, there's a lot, a lot of time and energy can go into trying to develop a space that just isn't going to end up being used. Um, and, and this has got to be ultimately about the end user as well. So, um, you know, go with the living, so to speak. I think this is a it's a policy issue as well that needs um, further uh, sort of uh, looking at you know the community rights um, agenda um, and and um, how that supports um, the question of, of of ownership should should properties just be allowed to kind of um, uh, be be left unused for you know decades um, and, and 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 is a real blight on um, a particular community. Um, there are real you know thorny legal issues there that need to be uh, unpicked. Um, but you know, in Scotland, you've got the kind of community right to buy. Um, I think these are policy levers um, that we need to look at. You know, should owners be kind of uh, uh, more forced in the direction of of, of, of letting out property, and, and how uh, how could that be be done? Um, because communities have to live with uh, this um, if um, if significant parts of their town are, are left uh, unused for 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 for, for a long time. That's a real issue for, for the economic development and, and well-being and, and, and everything of a, of a particular place. So I think this is something that, that needs looking at in terms of uh, the policy uh, uh, levers uh, we have to affect those changes. OK, that's great. Yeah, Mike? Um, yeah, I suppose what, one other thing is what, uh, something that we're looking at really is how, how do we legitimise meanwhile use um, more effectively as well? I think meanwhile use has been seen, um, you know, historically as you're, you're kind of potentially just squatting for a period of time and it's it's not legitimate. It's kind of while well, something else is going to happen. But more and more we're finding that, you know, that even, even in spaces that have, we have been approached by five years later, they're still not being used for anything. Um, and we've got to find a way of seeing meanwhile use as being a legitimate way of developing space and potentially spinning out new projects that can work within that locale um, and how that and how that meanwhile usage can be um, it can perhaps override some of the more technical issues that you have with policy and lease and contract and everything else that goes with it, a traditional way of taking on space um, so it's it's fine it's finding a route to just getting in and doing things again sometimes um, in order to in order to make things happen Okay, um, well, perhaps take one last one then, because I'm conscious we've run slightly over. Um, a, a few people have asked, how do you how do you work out what's the best use of a building? Stephen, do you want to kick us off with that one? Yeah, um, I, I think we, the way we've gone about it typically is is to through our understanding of our local area and our connections with the community. We, we've got a, a strong feel for the kind of uses that might be appropriate um, and, and we start to work in some detail exploring those uses and we do business planning work um, and, and try and figure out what's viable from that, that pool of uses. So to, to kind of exemplify um, from another project, we, we were until relatively recently looking at um, a grade two listed church uh, that was that's redundant and, and was being disposed of. Um, so when we were assessing potential uses for that, the, the scale of the building and its nature um, seemed, seemed to us that it was going to need quite a, an intensive, big sort of use. Um, we, we understood at that time that the tourism offer within our area was something that was a key policy focus for the local authority. Um, it was also something that was really underdeveloped. 
um, and there was so little kind of accommodation, um, overnight stay accommodation in the area, that, that that seemed to be a natural fit for that building. Um, we, we did some work around that, did some business planning work. We, we spoke to um, local holiday accommodation operators um, and, and kind of joined the dots to pull together um, what we felt was quite a credible business plan. Um, so so that, that's in a, in a kind of really high level way, the sort of approach we tend to use. Um, but it is, it, I think it's all grounded in that sort of quite in-depth understanding of, of what is needed in, in any given area. Okay, that's brilliant. Thanks. Uh, any other panelists want to say anything before we wrap up? Just a, a, a corporate plug: apply to the Architectural Heritage Fund for a project viability grant. Uh, but uh, uh, that would be that would be my first recommendation. Uh, but but also don't get fixed in your sort of if you approach a project viability sort of uh, 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 report with it's going to be this, um, then you know you're you're not going to have your biases tested or. Um, you may find um, that, that, that that idea is not viable, but you stick with it. Um, be, being open-minded, being prepared to change, uh, being prepared to be flexible about sort of how you see things um, is really, really um, important. So going into that with the right attitude and, and open-mindedness and let somebody objective come in and help you to kind of uh, maybe test ideas um, and your thinking, um, I think, is, uh, is, is, is really, uh, really important. Yeah, and I guess linked to that is about being creative think think thinking in sort of really diverse different ways you know you may well find some of the better ideas rather than the play safe uh, the play safe is probably going to be okay but more challenging so some of the ways sometimes it's just better to think differently um okay i think that's probably uh, it in terms of sort of questions as i say we will look through these and see whether there's uh, any other sort of responses we can make um thank you for your patience uh, apologies it's we've run over slightly this is the first of um I think at least 11 events will be running so this is partly a taster as well you're not going to get all the answers from this session and we will go into more detail as we go along with some of the others and indeed we will probably be asking for people's sort of views beforehand to sort of just get a bit of a an understanding of what people want and we can focus on those so um, again slight apologies for having a slight gremlin in the machine with some of the slides moving around inadvertently that wasn't anybody's fault it's just one of those things that happens uh, on these but we hope you've found this useful we hope you found this uh, a good step in terms of thinking I can see others have done this I want to do this too um, and the great thing is there are through Architecture Heritage Fund opportunities to develop up particularly some of the early stage work and other opportunities further down the line so this is us for now um, I say I hope you found it useful and we will look forward to seeing you at other times so thank you very much for your time and if you've got any sort of feedback or comments uh, we will be sending that round as well just so we can make these better as we go along so thank you very much goodbye thanks